He arrived near the town of Oakwood late in the evening, emerging from the woods along the main eastern trail. He paused to survey the flickering lights of the town nestled below, breathing in the air heavy with despair, before urging his chestnut stallion down the slope with a gentle press of his heels. The inn yard was unexpectedly quiet despite Oakwood's location on major trade routes. Inside the tavern, only a handful of local patrons were present, their faces marked by grim exhaustion and a palpable absence of life. As the stranger stepped into the room, all eyes turned towards him. He was a young man, about 25, of average height and build, but his tanned, agile frame spoke of his rugged lifestyle. His long black hair, streaked with gray, was pulled back with a leather strap, accentuating the sharp intensity of his gray eyes and the firm line of his thin lips. His attire was practical yet understated, a pair of sturdy trousers and a dark shirt complemented by a subtly gleaming belt. His travel-worn cloak was dusted with the journey's toll, and the crossguard of his sword peeked menacingly over his right shoulder. The emblem adorning his garment was well known to those present. This solemn young man belonged to the Hunter's Guild. Out of the corner of his eye he noticed a young boy darting about, attending to the sparse customers with a quiet urgency. Without a glance at the stranger, the boy hurried past and vanished into the kitchen, the back door slamming shut moments later. "'What will it be, Hunter?' the innkeeper asked, his tone less than welcoming. "'Braised vegetables and pork,' the hunter replied, his voice calm, and made his way to a secluded table." He sat, neatly arranging his cloak and unbuckling his belt to lay his sword beside him on the bench. A middle-aged man, evidently the elder of Oakwood, entered the tavern, followed by a young lad, still beardless, whispering fervently, Don't say anything unnecessary. He might just leave. Ignoring his son, the elder squinted through slightly myopic eyes and approached the hunter with measured steps. He paused giving the hunter a moment to look up before speaking in a voice tinged with forced steadiness. Welcome, hunter. We're relieved to have you here. I'm Darren, and this is my son. Let's dispense with formalities. We desperately need your help. Father, I wanted to say... The son attempted, but Darren sharply cut him off, pulling up a chair to sit across from the stranger. We're plagued by a monster... Darren began, his voice faltering. Nearly half the town has been affected. Fear and panic have gripped everyone. It spares no one, women, men, children, the elderly. It mercilessly devours them all. A horrific, relentless creature. When did it all start? The man's steady, low voice added a layer of calm to the tense atmosphere. It arrived here about two months ago. Darren murmured, his head bowed. All this time, the hunter leaned forward, his hands resting firmly on the table. A large ring with a dark stone glinted ominously on his index finger. You've lived with the monster nearby and didn't call for the guild? The elder seemed uncertain, struggling to find the right words. Father, his son whispered urgently, a note of warning in his voice. Darren took a deep breath, as if diving into deep waters, and began. I did send a request. Four hunters arrived, and... His voice trailed off as he hesitated again. Continue speak. Don't waste my time. The stranger leaned back in his chair, his demeanor relaxed yet commanding. They never returned, Darren confessed somberly his eyes downcast. By morning, we found only bloody shreds of their clothing and the remains of their horses. Two other squads passed through, but upon hearing that even four guild hunters couldn't subdue the beast, they declined to assist us. They left us, left us to our fate. This beast will devour us all. It spares no one. Just yesterday, Matthew, a local, fled Oakwood in haste with his family. 
Today his mare returned alone, drenched in blood. The elder's son groaned, lamenting his father's frankness, and buried his face in his hands. A heavy silence fell over the tavern. Eyes fixed on the unmoving hunter, some filled with resentment, others clinging to desperate hope. Three hundred gold. The hunter's voice cut through the silence, prompting a skeptical murmur from the crowd. Darren looked at the composed figure with a mix of surprise and disbelief, nodding hurriedly. Yes, yes, of course, Mr. Hunter. I understand three hundred gold for a hunting party is a significant sum, but we will certainly be able to pay. When can we expect your squad? I work alone, was the curt reply. The elder sputtered. What? Alone? Do you wish me to leave? The hunter's expression turned sour, and after a quick, anxious shake of the head from Darren, he returned to his meal. When the hunter set down his spoon, Darren, tactfully withdrawing to not disturb the guest, sidled up to him again, obeying a slight nod. The stranger tossed a coin to the innkeeper. No need for anything. All the food is on the house, announced the innkeeper. His attitude toward the hunter visibly softened after the agreement to eliminate the monster. The hunter shrugged nonchalantly, and the innkeeper, bowing repeatedly and clutching the coin, retreated to his counter. Did you find the bodies of those killed? The hunter inquired, turning back to Darren. No, Darren replied, his voice trembling. Who were the first victims? Our blacksmith, Edgar then the miller's eldest daughter, Alice, and after her, the miller himself. So the monster began its attacks from the outskirts of Oakwood. Yes, the elderly man shrugged. What was the interval between the attacks? The hunter inquired, standing up to fasten his belt and don his cloak. At first it was once a week, but now it's almost daily. The latest attack was just last night. Darren answered. Then you can sleep peacefully tonight. With determined strides, the man headed towards the door and exited. The heavy air of despair that had saturated the tavern began to slowly lift. Throughout the next day, the hunter relentlessly guided the elder from one victim's house to another, meticulously examining doors, windows, and exterior walls. Occasionally, he stooped to inspect something on the ground then demanded the visibly shaken Darren to lead him to where the remains of the hunting party had been discovered. By midday, the exhausted elder was pleading for a respite and offering lunch, which was met with a silent refusal and a stern request to visit the graveyard. At the cemetery, the hunter moved slowly along the row of graves, inspecting them intently, sometimes appearing to sniff the air. He then grimaced in disapproval, and proceeded towards the houses of the initial victims, which were situated on the outskirts and already deemed cursed. The elder trembled and lagged behind, only stopping when the blacksmith's house came into view beyond the low trees. The hunter seemed oblivious to his companion. He was absent for about fifteen minutes, after which he returned, whistling a tune thoughtfully. You know, he started, I need something from you. Anything. The elder was ready to do whatever it took, as long as it meant ridding their community of the terror. After sunset, no one is to venture outside, regardless of the reason or urgency, even if the world outside seems to be falling apart. His voice carried a tone of indifference. Anyone who dares to go out before dawn will have only themselves to blame. The elder nodded vigorously and hurried to spread the word among the townsfolk. Oakwood appeared deserted. Even the courtyard dogs hid under bushes and in their kennels, their fur bristling as they anxiously watched the thick darkness envelop the town. It was well past midnight, the hour when sleep is deepest and darkness most perilous. The darkness now swirling around the houses was not the usual transparent night. 
It was impenetrable, somber, and suffocating. And cold. A bone-chilling cold that seemed to emanate from all sides in waves, unlike any warm summer evening. The shadows began to stir, their movements subtle yet unmistakably sinister. The hunter strolled along the wide street, worn by the wheels of countless trade caravans that had stopped in the village overnight. His pace was deliberate and unhurried. Instead of a simple travel cloak, he donned a dense dark jacket embroidered with silver-threaded symbols along the edges. His sword lay quietly sheathed, ready for the moment it was needed. With a light flick of his fingers, a rune briefly glowed beneath them. His eyes emitted a soft glow, enhancing his vision to as clear as day. A swift shadow darted at the edge of his sight. The creature moved silently, a soft rustling of branches accompanying its passage through the thickening darkness. It was drawn by a compelling scent, the aroma of living, frightened, delicious prey. The heat of pulsing hearts and the rush of blood through veins drove it mad with hunger. This unusual figure, emitting none of the enticing scent of fear, made it shrink back into the shadows, tasting the air. Previous encounters, townsfolk, travelers, even those forearmed with biting silver, had smelled irresistibly of fear and desperation. But this one carried the scent of danger, threat, and death. The Bargist growled lowly, hesitating in confusion, feeling like prey for the first time. The cursed little human was heading where it couldn't go. He was close to the nest. He saw him. The elongated wolf-like muzzle. The thin, spring-like body sheathed in thick fur. The powerful legs with sharp, curled claws. The large, predatory eyes and gleaming fangs coated with venom. A Bargist, a vile creature often appearing as a massive black dog with fiery red eyes, capable of shape-shifting at will. It was the specter of a werewolf, a monster known for its deadly cunning, intelligence, and treachery, typically avoided by hunters. Those two squads hadn't left merely because they'd heard of the four dead hunters, as the Elder believed. They had chosen survival, calling for reinforcements. Soon two or three reinforced squads were expected to arrive, and ordinarily, the man wouldn't have bothered with a bargast. But this werewolf harbored what he needed. Moreover, it had made its nest under the blacksmith's old house, and the arriving hunting squads would face not only this monster, but also its dangerous offspring, due to emerge that night. Sensing a slight disturbance in the air, the hunter quickly spun around. His sword, with a predatory hiss, swept a wide arc, its silver runes gleaming as it slashed through the air. The creature dodged just in time. Fast. Very fast, the man noted. The monster lunged, aiming to claw at the hunter's eyes. Anticipating the move, the man easily ducked and swung his blade, leaving a deep gash along the creature's tough hide. The beast snarled, leaping into the air with a furious bound, its clawed paws striking at the hunter's chest and knocking him onto his back. But like a cat, the hunter twisted, kicked with the steel-clad toe of his boot, striking the gaping jaws with force, sending the werewolf recoiling. Simultaneously, he traced a rune in the air. A bright flash and a piercing, high-pitched squeal froze the creature momentarily. That brief confusion was all the hunter needed. He darted forward, his silver blade whistling as it sliced through resistant flesh. The creature roared in blinding pain, toppled over, and convulsed in spasms. The venom frothed on the bared fangs, twisted in a death grimace. Dark blood gushed in bursts from the smoldering wound, exposing a gray mass of entrails. The man waited until the creature's convulsions ceased completely, stepped forward, and with precise crosswise strokes, slid open its belly. He then bent down and picked up two small stones, glowing from within, about the size of large chicken eggs. He chuckled with satisfaction, and just as leisurely as before, 
walked towards the blacksmith's house. The residents only ventured out of their homes around noon, sniffing the scent of smoke and starting to survey their surroundings. Casting wary glances and counting those present, the elder breathed a sigh of relief. Just as that lad had promised, no one had gone missing today. He hurried to the stable yard. The owner, with dark circles under his eyes from a night spent in the basement, flinching at every sound, opened the gate and confessed he hadn't seen the hunter since the previous evening. The elder groaned helplessly. What had he been hoping for? That the damned young hunter, even with his graying hair and solitary nature, could defeat the creature that a whole group of four hunters hadn't managed to handle. The approaching sounds of human voices and excited barking of dogs pulled him from his gloomy thoughts. The approaching hunter tossed a large burlap sack with a dark stain on the side at the elder's feet. The untied ends flew apart, and a gruesome, snarling face in its final grimace met the old man's boot. He recoiled to the side, gasping. The blacksmith's house had to be burned down, the unscathed hunter stated indifferently, along with the werewolf's nest. The crowd, staring in horror at the monster's severed head and their savior, held its breath, recoiling in fear, then erupted into chatter once more. The elder covered his eyes, overwhelmed by the realization of what this man had saved them from, and handed him the heavy, dull-sounding pouch with trembling hands. The hunter didn't even bother to count the coins, just nodded and extended a clenched fist to the elder. Give this to the squad commander who will arrive soon, he said, as four rings with stones gleaming with the guild's emblem rolled onto the elder's palm. The elder opened his mouth, amazed at the rings that had belonged to the deceased quartet. But the hunter, abruptly turning away, was already walking towards the inn, while children started to gather around the werewolf's head lying in the dust on the road. Master Hunter, the elder called out as the man mounted his horse. What's your name? The man paused, holding his horse, then replied thoughtfully, Godwin before spurring the chestnut stallion which trotted steadily down the road. The stream of people moving through the city gates flowed unusually slowly today. Here and there, scuffles erupted as eager individuals tried to push through, clashing with those who had been waiting since early morning. Meanwhile, the sun dipped toward the horizon, casting a glow on tired faces, laden carts, irritated guards of trade caravans and jittery merchants. Godwin navigated silently through the dense crowd, riding almost to the gates, his horse rudely pushing people aside. Outraged shouts fell silent as the onlookers noticed the guild emblem, and the crowd quickly dispersed, clearing a path for the chestnut stallion and its composed rider. Upon reaching the heavy iron-clad gates, Godwin immediately identified the cause of the congestion. Standing next to the guards who were inspecting the entrance was a silent figure clad in a robe embroidered with two crossed golden torches on the back. The Inquisition. What were they doing here? Godwin wondered, clicking his tongue in annoyance. The Holy Order had emerged five centuries ago, heralding a new era with the rise of the seven higher gods. Over the years, they had become a constant source of headache. The Holy Brethren wielded their power without hesitation, employing it for noble causes, eradicating monsters, witches, and demons, and not so noble ones, targeting nature spirits, leading to severe cataclysms, and pursuing people who practiced beneficial arts like village healers, alchemists, and physicians. Their indiscriminate approach to identifying foes had sparked the first large-scale conflict between humans and magical folk, known as the War of Cleansing Flame. It was debatable who came out victorious. Humans believed they had won, but Godwin knew better. The magical beings, referring to these events as nothing short of a rebellion, had simply vanished one day leaving behind desolation and ashes that blanketed the scorched earth like a bitter cloak. 
Nonetheless, the order considered the outcome justifiable. The boundaries of the Blessed Land, the realm of magical entities, had been pushed far to the east. Before this, mythical creatures had nearly overrun the mainland, but it was then they had ceded territory to humans. An enthusiastic army led by the Holy Brothers and the Grand Master, battered and exhausted yet filled with resolve, ventured beyond the border to expel the foes from lands they never owned. They were met with fierce resistance, suffering losses from which they never fully recovered. Despite the Master's efforts to rally the people for continued warfare, he could not convince them that victory was within reach. It was said that at this point, the Master lost the favor of the Seven because he, along with a group of the strongest brothers and inquisitors, no more than two hundred, disappeared into enemy territory. Whether he perished or achieved his goal remained unknown, but since then, the Holy Order's influence had permeated the young kingdom, and the fidelity of its servants to the Seven was unquestionable. Now the Brethren were zealously eliminating any trace of magical lineage in those possessing powers, sorcerers. Against monsters their magic proved mostly ineffective, giving way to solid steel, leading to a fraught relationship with the Hunter's Guild, as they were often seen as rivals. Lord Godwin, a tall guard greeted him respectfully. It's been a while since we last saw you. The man nodded in acknowledgement and remained silent, his gaze fixed intently on the Inquisitor. Lord Hunter, the servant addressed Godwin sternly. Please proceed swiftly. Godwin frowned in displeasure, but noticing the uneasy glances of the guards, dismounted gracefully from his horse. The Inquisitor ran the signal amulet over Godwin's body, which emitted a steady green light. Satisfied, the priest nodded slightly and stepped aside, allowing the hunter to enter the city. Taking horse by the reins and casting a final glance at the Inquisitor, Godwin passed through the gates. Sir, exclaimed the elderly housekeeper joyfully, greeting the master of the two-story stone house a massive and rather gloomy structure. Come in quickly. I'll prepare the bath for you. Hello, Edith, Godwin replied, his voice once sharp and dry, now softened. I'm glad to see you're well. Three hours later, having washed off the road dust, changed clothes, and hastily eaten, Godwin picked up a heavy folder bound with twisted clasps, slung an ornate purse from his belt, and donning a sash with a simple sword, left the house, saying as he departed, Edith, I'll be late, so no need to wait up. He saw the understanding nod from the elderly woman as he quickly disappeared around the corner. He walked with confidence, navigating the dimly lit maze of intertwining alleys with ease. Figures lurking in the shadows, waiting for unsuspecting or intoxicated passers-by, froze and concealed themselves as soon as they caught sight of the dimly gleaming buckle with its engraving. Half an hour later, Godwin found himself in the craftsman's quarter, stopping before a neatly adorned house with a sign featuring a hammer and anvil. Without hesitation, he entered the backyard, opened the gate, and patting the head of the joyfully wagging watchdog, made his way to a low building from which dull thuds emanated. He knew his friend, the blacksmith, often worked late. All blessings of the gods, Godwin, the blacksmith greeted him, a sturdy forty-year-old man with broad shoulders, a thick beard and iron-like muscles rippling across his mighty, sweat-glistened arms as he stepped towards the lad and embraced him in a steel-like grip. I haven't seen you in ages, was starting to think you'd vanished somewhere, the blacksmith remarked seriously. What brings you here? Godwin chuckled, noticing the eager sparks in Alfred's guileless gaze and placed the folder he had brought on the table. Just once, I wish you'd come without a purpose, the blacksmith teased, a mischievous glint in his eyes as he reached for the parchment tied with strings. 
Last time I came without a purpose, I ended up with a pounding headache after a night of revelry. Godwin laughed, his laughter hearty and genuine. In response, Alfred snorted good-naturedly into his thick mustache. Gods, Godwin, what have you brought me this time? He looked with surprise at the dense sheets. You know, he said, leaning over the drawings. I thought I wouldn't have to make anything stranger than that sword. Seems I was mistaken. What are we doing with these? These are for throwing, Godwin chuckled, surveying the metal blanks arrayed on the workbench against the wall. Can you forge them? Wait, the blacksmith frowned, examining the designs. This isn't just steel and silver. There's an unusual alloy here. Where will I get? He paused mid-sentence, watching as Godwin produced two glowing stones from his belt pouch and placed them on the table. Will the dark hearts of monsters suffice? Godwin grinned broadly. By all the gods, Alfred gasped, his eyes wide as he stared at the stones. So you took down that werewolf, the Bargist in Oakwood, two days' ride from here? Rumors travel fast, Godwin muttered, his expression darkening. Faster than you'd think, the blacksmith said, his tone turning grave. You're drawing too much attention to yourself. The entire guild is buzzing about you, and you keep picking the most perilous creatures to hunt. The other hunters can handle the rest, Godwin replied, clearly not pleased with the direction of the conversation. Three teams of hunters went to Oakwood, fifteen in total, and they had support from the Inquisition. And yet you took down that beast alone. If the Holy Order learns about your use of magical runes, they'll hang you from the nearest tree, the blacksmith warned in a hushed voice. I doubt that, Godwin scoffed. Speaking of Inquisitors, what are they doing here? A sorcerer showed up a week ago spread plague in a village to the south, and three days later, he activated some ancient dark ritual in the misty mountains. After that, creatures began pouring out of the mountains. The entire city was on its feet fighting them off. Now the priests are grilling everyone for answers. They won't find anything, Godwin snorted dismissively. If that sorcerer has any sense, he's long gone from this city and its surrounds. Who knows, the blacksmith shrugged. I take it, you need these weapons as soon as possible? Exactly, Godwin said, noting the serious expression on the blacksmith's face. I'll be back tomorrow evening when you start forging. Kid, you're playing with fire, Alfred spoke softly, concern etching his features. With an Inquisitor in town, they might not notice your dark weapons. But if you start casting spells right under his nose, they'll catch you in no time. It's a fine line, Godwin replied tersely, signaling the end of the discussion. See you tomorrow evening. Fool, the blacksmith sighed deeply, shaking his head as he watched his friend depart, then turned his attention back to the plans laid out before him. The next day, late in the evening, they began their work. Alfred, wielding his hammer with force, shaped the strange, slightly glowing, bluish steel. Godwin, standing apart and folding his fingers into intricate patterns, murmured softly, shielding his eyes. The alloy sparked, shifting colors. Unusual runes appeared sporadically on the emerging form. As the blacksmith tirelessly worked, he cast several wary glances at the intensely focused hunter. Even he, with no leanings towards the magical arts, felt the hair on his arms stand from the energy that Godwin channeled into the new weapons. What then of the inquisitorial trackers, experts in detecting magic? Once the work on the steel was completed, Godwin, visibly exhausted, slumped onto a stool. Wiping the sweat from his brow, he inquired, When will they be ready? In two days, the blacksmith muttered as he began to tidy his tools. And sooner? 
Is that possible? Godwin pressed, his tone betraying his urgency. Your audacity knows no bounds, the blacksmith retorted, his gaze stern. I've already put off all my other commissions for you, and these mechanisms need additional small parts crafted before assembly. All right, all right, I understand, Godwin conceded, raising his hands in a gesture of peace and catching the blacksmith's begrudging nod. Later, at the training ground, Godwin moved with precision and grace, his routine a dance of combat. He struck, pivoted, and blocked, his sword a silver flash cutting through the air, its lethal melody uninterrupted. Leap, spin, strike, block, counter. With a swift motion, Godwin executed a high leap, twisting in the air and driving his sword down in a ferocious arc, its cry piercing the silence. He paused, sweeping a stray gray lock behind his ear. His shirt, darkened by sweat, clung to his neck, the damp hair of his ponytail sticking to his skin. You wield that sword with exceptional skill, came an approving voice. Godwin turned sharply, his eyes narrowing on the unexpected visitor. I didn't invite you here, he stated flatly, wiping his glistening face with a towel. I often find myself uninvited, the Inquisitor replied with a smirk, his thin lips curling slightly. I've heard quite a bit about you, Mr. Godwin. Flattered, Godwin replied dryly, his voice laced with irritation. I was there, the priest continued, capturing Godwin's attention with his intense gaze. In Oakwood, where you impressively dealt with that spectral werewolf and its spawn, how do you manage it? Working alone is already a feat, but to also handle the offspring of darkness so effectively, what's your secret? A secret wouldn't be a secret if it weren't kept, Godwin snapped, his annoyance growing. Did you come here on business, or is this just to satisfy your curiosity? The Inquisitor's smile widened as he sat on a nearby bench against the house wall. The dynamic between hunters and priests was fraught, akin to that between cats and dogs. In theory, they could coexist peacefully, but in practice, each encounter was tense, filled with bared teeth and hissed threats. Mr. Godwin, have you heard about the sorcerer? The Inquisitor asked, shifting the topic as he settled more comfortably. Yes, I've heard the rumors, Godwin acknowledged. I've been searching for him for four days now, after he activated the dark ritual. And so far, no traces, as if he dissolved into thin air. Usually sorcerers aren't clever enough to hide in time, let alone cover their tracks. But, the Inquisitor mused, rubbing his nose thoughtfully, yesterday I detected faint echoes of sorcery. Not the common low-grade magic typically used, but actual summoning magic. It was a subtle hint, barely noticeable. Godwin's expression hardened. Sorcerers are not my concern. This murderer, the priest said, rising to his feet, is not as straightforward as he seemed initially. And if he succeeds in summoning something more formidable than just monsters, we might soon need your expertise. Godwin remained silent, his eyes following the Inquisitor's departure with a thoughtful gaze. In the forge, Alfred preferred solitude while working, finding distractions unhelpful to his concentration. He typically chased away anyone who dared enter his workspace. However, Godwin was the exception. The blacksmith felt a reassuring calmness with his friend present, who now sat quietly in a corner lit by the forge's glow, absorbed in a book. As Alfred applied the final touches to the weapon, Godwin sprang from his seat, eager to handle the new creation. He grasped the freshly forged weapon, a silvery disc that transformed into a wheel with three razor-sharp blades in his hands. With a forceful thrust, he embedded it deep into the stone wall, where it hissed angrily. Alfred watched, impressed, as Godwin effortlessly retrieved the weapon. Alf, you're a genius, Godwin complimented, 
examining another disc for its balance, flipping it in his hands to test its weight. The blacksmith beamed with pride, his beard hiding his smile. Godwin always brought him blueprints for unimaginably unique weapons, which delighted the skilled craftsmen. He's ruined all my walls, Alfred joked, chuckling as he saw a hint of remorse flicker across Godwin's youthful face. I had an unwelcome guest today, Godwin remarked, a satisfied smile on his lips as he fastened the discs into special sheaths on his belt. The Inquisitor. Alfred choked on his breath. Godwin, he began sternly, I've warned you. He asked me to help him catch the sorcerer, the hunter continued nonchalantly. He says the sorcerer is hiding somewhere around here. And what good does that do you? The blacksmith asked grimly. Sorcerers are their problem. They're worried he's a powerful sorcerer who might summon a terrifying monster. I have to be involved because besides me, there are no hunters in the city right now. Although I doubt... Godwin's voice trailed off. His pupils dilated with sudden alertness, his gaze fixated on the distance. A foul stench of decay wafted through the air. Damn these monsters, Godwin cursed under his breath, wiping the sweat from his brow. Alf, gather the guards. This cursed sorcerer has summoned corpse werewolves. Keep them away from the people. Startled, the blacksmith nodded and grabbing a hefty battle axe, hurried after the hunter who had already vanished into the night's dark embrace. Corpse werewolves. These hideous creatures were not only incredibly malevolent, but also harbored a deep hatred for humankind. Summoning them was akin to a twisted form of suicide, as these beasts would never submit to a human. They roamed in packs, capable of annihilating entire cities, leaving nothing but ruin in their wake. Unlike spectral bargists, corpse werewolves were bulkier, which ironically made them more vulnerable, easier targets for ranged weapons. The fate of the townsfolk hung in the balance. If Godwin couldn't subdue these monsters, devastation was certain. He darted through the city's dark streets like a shadow, his intuition leading him towards the gates, near the graveyard where such creatures were most likely to appear. Racing past the sleeping guards, he startled them awake with his urgent shout, Close the gates, you fools! Werewolves are upon us! Without waiting for the guards to overcome their confusion, he pressed on toward the burial grounds. From a distance, he could already see the flickering glows of eyes, pinpoints of malevolent light rapidly approaching. Familiar with the dark arts, Godwin swiftly traced a protective rune, revealing the grotesque silhouettes of his adversaries in the shadow. They rushed towards their prey, their laughter echoing eerily like hyenas. With a grim smile, Godwin executed a series of gestures, launching the spinning discs towards the advancing spirits. Illuminated by runic light, the weapons sliced through the night, decapitating two of the beasts, their remains dissolving into ash. He then smoothly circled to catch the returning weapons. The remaining creatures howled in rage and descended upon him. Godwin, agile and precise, dodged and deflected their frenzied attacks his movements a blur. Each strike he delivered was lethal, thinning their numbers swiftly. Suddenly, one of the beasts managed a close swipe, its claws grazing Godwin's cheek, leaving a stinging slash. Though outnumbered, Godwin prepared to unleash another spell, his fingers weaving through the air in intricate patterns. Just as death loomed close, and he was about to activate his spell, Godwin sensed an imminent threat from behind. With no time to complete his incantation, he dodged sideways, narrowly avoiding a lethal blow. Shielding his face with his arm, a blinding beam of light erupted from behind him, engulfing the enraged werewolves and reducing them to dust. Godwin hissed in pain, 
feeling the heat sear his hand and squinted against the intense light. As the dust settled, he stood, lowering his sword. The torchlight revealed a familiar figure in robes approaching. Are you alive? What a relief, said the Inquisitor, stepping closer, his face illuminated by the light. Ever thought of warning your allies before striking? Godwin hissed, his anger barely contained. The Holy Palm is harmless to humans, the priest stated indifferently, turning away. It poses a threat only to the undead and sorcerers. The Inquisitor didn't notice Godwin's flinch as he quickly slipped on gloves over his burned hands. What of the sorcerer? Godwin asked in a low, tense voice as he followed the priest. His own creations devoured him as one might expect, the Inquisitor replied, turning back to peer curiously at Godwin. Thank you for containing them, Mr. Godwin. I don't hunt for free, Godwin muttered under his breath. Understood, the priest replied calmly. Whenever you pass by any of our monasteries, stop by and say you're from Brother Guy. They'll pay you. Everything is always so straightforward for you, Godwin said quietly, sidestepping a group of startled guards bombarding the priest with questions. He trudged slowly home, cradling his searing right hand against his chest. The next morning, Godwin struggled to rise from bed, his head pounded, his body ached as if battered the day before, and his eyes were irritated, constantly watering. The pain in his right hand not only persisted but seemed to flare with renewed intensity, although the cursed light from the Inquisitor had left no visible mark. Groaning, Godwin cursed the priest to eternal damnation, slowly got dressed, and made his way downstairs. You have a letter, sir, Edith said, as she handed a thick envelope to Godwin as he entered the dining hall. Godwin nodded in thanks, his brow furrowing as he recognized the guild's emblem and seal on the envelope. He scanned the contents quickly. Enraged, he crumpled the fragile paper and threw it to the floor. Godwin? Alf said in surprise as he watched his friend enter. Godwin's expression was dark, his mood foul. Are the throwing discs still here? He asked abruptly, foregoing any greetings. Yes, still here from last time, and I've crafted a few new ones, the blacksmith replied, pulling out a small carved box and retrieving the silver-edged throwing discs. No one else knows how to handle them as you do? Thanks, Godwin grunted. What's wrong? Alf asked, noting the hunter's grim demeanor. I received a letter from the guild demanding my immediate presence, Godwin explained, a scowl crossing his face. Do they think I'm merely their errand boy? Forget it, Alf dismissed with a wave of his hand. They fear you like fire. Remember, they only contact you by letter for orders while other hunters report in person. Something serious must be up. I'm exhausted, Alf. Godwin sighed, his voice heavy. He slumped onto a low stool. I've been on the road for half a year, constantly battling shapeshifters and werewolves. I'm sick of their stench. He ran his hand through his already tousled hair, making it even messier. The blacksmith looked at his friend in astonishment. He had never spoken about his own condition, never complained, even when he had crawled in two months ago looking like half a corpse, with a wide, gaping wound. Bleeding profusely, he still managed to curse with colorful language, blaming the cursed monsters and quacks of healers who were ready to sell their souls for a coin and couldn't heal properly. If this is the Inquisition's doing, the hunter hissed, I swear by the abyss, I'll cut them all down. Watch your tongue advised Alfred. If anyone hears us, how will you talk your way out of it? Grumbling something unintelligible under his breath, Godwin grabbed a pouch made of sturdy leather filled with throwing discs and headed towards the exit. What happened to your hand? The blacksmith belatedly asked, only now noticing that his friend was nursing his right hand. 
the werewolves got to me, the hunter replied as he turned at the threshold. Until we meet again, Alf, and thank you. Good luck to you, friend, the blacksmith said quietly, watching the door close behind Godwin. The hunter's preparations didn't take long. Carefully attaching the sheaths with discs to his belt, he donned a sword belt, arranged the sharp discs in special leather pockets stitched all over his clothes, and after a moment's thought, tucked knives behind his bootstraps. He grabbed saddlebags and bid farewell to the genuinely concerned housekeeper before heading to the stables. The steed, sensing his master, first neighed joyfully, then as if someone had switched it, jerked sideways, eyes wide with fear, snorting and foaming at the mouth. Godwin looked disappointedly at the animal, gently stroking its soft muzzle and whispering soothing words. Again, only two weeks. Damn it. I'll have to buy a new horse every day at this rate, he muttered. He effortlessly mounted the prancing horse and holding it back, headed out of the town.